Probably what's pertinent for me is I had a girlfriend once in Whangarei and to impress her, her parents were regular churchgoers and her dad was a bank manager. So I thought I'd go along to church and rocked up on the Sunday morning. We all went to church. They did their service and, at, and they talked about the starving in Africa and they talked about how terrible it was and at the end of it they collected the money and then everyone went into a room like that and had a wonderful cup of tea and biscuits and good conversation about how the day was and so on. And then they all went home and they all felt really wonderful because they'd, they'd done their moral duty and given to the people in Africa. And just up the road, 800 metres, was Otangarei, which was a place of the greatest need in Whangarei. And I thought, what a shame they didn't actually get in their cars and decide to drive up there and adopt a family and actually do some real work and actually work in. And I think, in many ways, that seems to be the sum-up feeling of poverty for me, is who, who actually really cares? Really? It's all about me and my car and my boat and where I'm travelling to and... Do people really give us stuff, and do they really care? Where's the Araha? I work in a secondary school, obviously, um, and I'm a heretic because I actually don't believe in secondary schooling. And I actually went into it to try and make some difference and some change. The poverty I see is the reason I want to rush back is because I've got a school full of quite anxious kids and quite anxious teachers. And constantly there's an edge with that and you're, you're always trying to manage that edge because that anxiety sits there. So what I love is when people in suits come to talk about poverty. <laughs> I was born in Whangarei, in Otangarei, and my father left home before I can even remember. I used to bash my head on the wall and in my infancy, I think I was a very difficult child. Solo mother, three children, no benefits in those days. And we had nothing. Everything we had was given to us. We walked everywhere. No TV, no phone, none of that. Don't feel sorry for me because we actually had bloody good fun. We actually enjoyed it because we didn't know any different. I had two of those four factors against me. When we went from Otangarei Primary, and yes, we ran the streets, we stole stuff. Everything, to get anything, we had to steal. So that was what we grew up with. We went to intermediate, and they stuck us all in the bottom class. And right through school, what I saw in schooling was a system where kids were turned off and labelled and how hard it was to, to get through. But the one thing that made a difference for me is I had one teacher who believed in me, one. And that teacher, for me, made a lot of difference. I did the usual thing. My brother was always in trouble with the cops, so I tried to keep away from that sort of thing. I backed out of it. I kept my friends. They went to jail. I went off, I joined a bikey gang, I rode with a bikey gang for six months. Mum brought me to my senses, of all things. And I thought, right, I did lots of jobs every six months, different jobs. Went to actually, decided I wanted to go teaching. Applied for the job, applied for teaching, of course got turned down. I had got that look again. You know that sneering look? That, mm, like something on the bottom of my shoe. I applied... The next time, because they were crying out for males in primary schools, and I thought, I'm in, I'm a male, they're going to grab me. No, nah. oh, you're too thick, don't want you. In the end, I went to university, did a bachelor in Māori studies. I had wonderful lecturers, Ranginui Walker, Patariki uh, Hohepa, people like that. And so I know and I understand what poverty is. And what poverty feels like well, if I turned off the lights, you might start to feel. Poverty, for me, felt like total hopelessness. There was no hope. There was nobody there to support you. You had a mum in tears. You had a mum with multiple boyfriends. The risk was constantly in your face. In fact, the only power you ever had was when you ran with the bros. That's the only time you ever felt good. 
What can we do here? Well, firstly, the ideal is, of course, we would be at the Morai and it would be the local people telling us about what poverty is. It would be the real people affected. And I think they're sick of being done to, and they're sick of being judged, and they're sick of being labelled. It's a bloody hard rut to get out of. I think, for me, I look at this area, and I'm a historian, I know you've only got to read what colonisation has done to this area, how much land was ripped away to know why the people here suffer. You don't have to be a, a brain surgeon to know that. And to me, I see the answers for me lie in Māoridom. In education, the best research in the world comes out of Māori. The Māori research is way ahead of anything else you'll get internationally. Ko tahitanga projects, tamia, tamia, tamia. We are starting to be ahead of the game. And as much as people don't like the minister and what she does, I think hallelujah, because she's put Māori education up front and she's put the ball up front. And poverty changes when you start getting education. This morning, as usual, I had kids wandering in late. I had the choice to barrel them and tell them off, and I didn't. I greeted them and I talked to them. We had a conversation because that's what they need constantly. Our kids here need all the love and all the support we can give them and all the opportunities. And I do think the solutions are here. There's a lot of money in this area for doing everything, from the schools to the services. There's a lot of government money, but the people need the voice. And I think at the moment it's a shame still more Māori don't vote, but I have total faith that if, if the decision, if the rangatira tanga was actually given to Māori, I know people would come first and not the money. Because the wealth and the inequality of wealth is killing us internationally as well as nationally. What's the solution? For me, we're starting to get there with the schools. We're actually starting to get off our high horses and think, what can we really do? What are we doing wrong? What do the parents want? What do the kids want? And change and adapt. Start listening and start changing. In a society like this, the kamatu akuia, the answers are there. It's giving people the, the right and the ability to have that say. And above all, I think it, it has to be about people taking this really seriously. If you go through history, it doesn't take too long. People will only put up with an unequal society for so long. And so if you don't want a bloody end, you start to make a difference now. And I still think it has to be a question for every single person. As somebody said, you know, is it just another talk fest? Is this all hooey or is this all dooey? And that has to be the fundamental question. Who really cares? Who's prepared to pay their taxes? Who's prepared to get off their bum and make a difference with a kid? Or a whānau. Don't just give your money and walk away. Give your time and give your heart. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here, so it's all a bit ass about face probably. But we can do it, but we have to be honest. Really, really honest. And as I said to some staff members the other day, and we're having a discussion... Sometimes I, forget, I think we forget how mortal we are. And I think that needs to come first. If my life was a trip from here to Auckland, I'm probably at Wells uh, Walkworth by now. And if we're all more concerned about, well, actually, how much time do I have left on this earth and what do I want to give as quality, mm. rather than where's my next holiday, how much money have I got, or what am I going to do here... I think that's the big thing. And I, I think as a society in New Zealand, and I'm starting to see it, but as a society in New Zealand, I think it's about all of us being really, really genuine and deciding what each, of, each one of us can actually do. Because I can tell you one thing for a fact. The kids you have walking around this town are beautiful kids with massive potential and ability. And... 
although I got unpopular with the ministry for going on TV, sometimes you've got to make it stand and say, enough. I'm not taking this crap any longer. How dare these kids be treated like this? And how dare the whānau and community be treated like this? Let's make that stand and make the difference. So from my point of view, I think the more, and we're seeing it with the communities of learning, we're seeing it with the place-based funding, the more that decision-making actually comes home, the better. Because the answers for tomorrow are not today's current solutions. And we've got to be prepared, prepared to handle that. So for me as a principal, I've got to be prepared to walk away at some stage and go, it's the people's decision. If the answer in education is charter schools, and I have no beef against charter schools at all, I was talking to Mark earlier, anything that's going to work better, we grab it and we do it. We don't cling on to what's there currently because, oh, that's my job or that's my institution, I'm going to protect it. It has to be about us. And my worry is always, I'm looking out there for all the little me's. The people that desperately want someone who's going to give them something. And all the whānau out there that desperately need help but don't want to see another police car rock up or another official car rock up or anything like that. We've got to take this seriously. We've got to be real. And above all, we get moving. We've done enough talk. We've got to do more action. That's what I see. Kia ora.